Greetings, everyone. Um, welcome to this webinar. I am Kurdo Said. I'm a consultant clinical microbiologist in Southampton University Hospital in the UK. And I'm delighted to welcome you to this webinar on bone and joint infections. We have uh, three great speakers with uh, three great topics to talk about this afternoon. Uh, the meeting is organized by the uh, bone and joint and skin infection working group of the International Society of Antimicrobial Chemotherapy, um, ISAC. ISAC uh, is, um, is founded in 1961 and it's a federation of affiliated societies across the, the globe. The aim of ISAC is to uh, enhance knowledge about antimicrobial stewardship, antimicrobial resistance, and ways to tackle antimicrobial resistance globally. Uh, we have about, in ISAC, about 100 um, uh, in national or international societies with um, over 60,000 individual members. Um, please bear with us when, when, we, when, we, when we have the talks. I will try to aim all your, uh, to answer all your questions with the, with the speakers. Please put your questions in the webinar chat as we go along. And we have uh, hopefully three minutes or so, or five to answer critical questions. But if you uh, felt your question had, wasn't answered, please feel free to email ISAC secretary and either myself or one of the speakers uh, would aim to get back to you about these questions. And before we start with the first talk, um, just a reminder for everyone, there will be another ISAC webinar um, on the 11th of April, April same time, one o'clock UK time uh, in the afternoon. Uh, about rapid diagnostics and biomarkers. There are lots of interesting talks has been organized for that, especially specifically about metagenomics, about rapid diagnostics and UTI, and also diagnosis and impact of diagnosis of hepatitis B in low and middle income countries. Please join us for that. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker, who is uh, Dr. Antonius Scobie, who's a consultant in medical microbiology and infectious diseases at the Royal Free Hospital um, in uh, London, UK. And also she's the microbiologist and the research lead for the Royal National Orthopedic uh, Hospital, uh, again in, in the UK. Antonia has huge experience in dealing with bone and joint infection and more recently uh, leading bacteriophage therapy group in the UK, clinical group in the UK. Um, so I'm looking forward to uh, Antonia's talk. Please, Antonia, feel free to share your slides and start your talk. Um, and I'll keep monitoring the chat. Thank you again for the introduction. And I'm going to talk a bit about uh, bone and joint, uh, phage therapy in the wider sense, but also focusing on uh, the evidence in bone and joint infection. And so I think to understand um, where we are with bacteriophage therapy and the challenges and obstacles we face, you have to understand a little bit about the history of how we've got here. Um, uh, the phenomenon of bacteriophages was actually first described by um, two British uh, microbiologists, um, originally uh, back in 1896, and then again 20 years later, who observed, uh, initially uh, Ernest Hankin, observed an unidentified substance which he found had antibacterial activity in river samples from uh, the Ganges and other rivers in India that had activity against Vibrio cholerae. Um, 20 years later, another, uh, British microbiologists described what he called a glassy transformation of micrococcus colonies, which we would later to come to understand is, is lysis. Um, but nothing really happened with this until about two years later, where a French Canadian microbiologist called Felix Durrell um, uh, was able to, to prove that in uh, patients with uh, dysentery, that there were these invisible microbes, which he later characterized as bacteriophages, which are sort of eaters of bacteria. Um, that were able to antagonize the bacteria uh, in these cases. And he proved that the titus went up in disease progression and they peak during recovery. And um, what he did to prove his, his theory was he managed to create a suspension of phages and tested it initially on himself, then his co-workers, then his family, and then patients in that order um, to, to prove the concepts. Um, and then um, 
uh, again, in continuing this work in Paris, uh, other um, clinicians continue to publish their experience with using bacteriophages as therapy for dysentery. Um, sorry, my sound is not moving. Um, so we've got our pictures of them. And then um, they basically uh, then went on to, to use bacteriophage therapy for staphylococcal and streptococcal uh, skin infections. And uh, in the 20s, uh, up until the early 30s, there was a lot of interest in bacteriophage therapy as a therapeutic option. Um, but uh, to understand why bacteriophage therapy largely fell out of favor, this timeline of, of the discovery of antimicrobials should, should show you that essentially the explosion of new, novel antimicrobial agents between the 30s and the 60s um, meant that there were effective treatments against bacteria, and um, the a few papers were report, were published in the 20s in American journals questioning some of the efficacy of bacteriophages. So the combination of the two meant that in Western medicine, at least, bacteriophage therapy pretty much disappeared as a, as a therapeutic option. And uh, the use of antimicrobial agents was, was the mainstay of bacterial treatment. Um, but the work did continue in, in Russia, and particularly in, U in the USSR and Georgia and in Russia. And um, the, unfortunately, a lot of the research and the, the findings were, were not really kept uh, or well published in the scientific arena. But actually, as you can see, and as we know, the pipeline of antibiotic discovery started to wane. And over the last 20 years, we've only had one uh, potential novel class of antibiotics uh, that have been developed. Uh, there are very few anti new novel antimicrobials that will cover the resistant both gram positive and gram negative, but particularly some of our problems with extensively drug resistant organisms. So over the past 10 to 20 years, there's been a bit of a resurgence in the interest of phage therapy um, in the absence of effective antibiotics. So if I asked you to picture what a bacteriophage looked like, I imagine most of you would probably think of something uh, along the lines of this. There are bacteriophages that don't look like this, but essentially um, the DNA of the, of the virus is, in, is encased in, in the capsid. And what you have about bacteriophages that makes them slightly more unique is they have this tail and these tail fibers and spikes. And these are what bacteria the, the phages use to attach to bacteria and gain entry of their genetic material into, into bacteria. Bacteria. And what is a bacteriophage? Well, essentially, it's a virus that infects bacteria and it only infects bacteria. So there's never been a reported human or eukaryotic cell to be infected by a bacteriophage. And just to give you an idea of the vast numbers of phages that are present in our ecosystem, they are present absolutely everywhere. So in every human microbiome, there will be bacteriophages. There are almost 10 to the 31 phages estimated to be in the ecosystem. And when you compare that to our, our population of up to 8 billion, we are very much dwarfed by uh, the number of bacteriophages. And you can get up to a billion bacteriophages in just a milliliter of water. And even on and on every day, it's it's um, believed that over thirty billion phage particles can move in and out of our, our human tissues in our body. So where do you find bacteriophages? Essentially anywhere there is bacteria. So um, if you are inclined to go out hunting for bacteriophages in the environment, and and this is how most of the phage banks are being developed across the world. Uh, you essentially just need to go to, to where you might find bacteria. So hospitals are a very good environment to isolate bacteriophages, but also sewage systems and water treatment systems and just in the local ecosystems. And this is um, in the UK, for example, as part of the citizen science project that people will go and try and find bacteriophages and send them in. And then you can choose if you find a novel bacteriophage, you can name it after whatever, whatever you see fit. And how do they work? Well, essentially... Uh, what uh, you have two types of bacteriophage. So you have lytic and lysogenic. So lytic are the ones that that we usually are referring to when we talk about bacteriophage therapy, which essentially um, attach the bacterial cell. They get absorbed uh, and then penetrate their DNA into the bacterium, and they hijack the, hijack the bacterial cell machinery to to synthesize new phage particles, which then assemble and then re release into the environment. And doing so, that doing so, they lyse the bacteria, um, and it can take up to uh, minutes to several hours for this to happen after infection with a bacteriophage of a bacteria. And just one bacteriophage particle can go on to produce 50 to up to 200 per infection cycle. Um, 
when you have there's another type of phage called lysogenic which essentially what we learn about when we we are taught about mechanisms of bacterial resistance um antibacterial resistance is essentially the phage inserts its genome into the host genome of the bacterium and doesn't really do very much just lies dormant and then in response to various environmental signals it may go on to release prophage material and 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 replicate that way but it doesn't cause cell lysis in that in the sense that um, we would see as helpful to us from a therapeutic um, perspective. So you can go out and find lots of phages, but you might find that um, you end up with a lot of lysogenic phages, which don't currently have uh, a lot of use, but I will talk about later on uh, how we may be able to, to use lysogenic phages. So the potential therapeutic role of phages, well, there are lots of aspects that you can you can target. The thing with bacteriophages is they're also very specific to a certain bacteria. So you can have a Staph aureus phage that will infect only Staph aureus, and it may infect only one strain of Staph aureus, it may infect 30 to 40 different strains. And so you can use that directly to um, cause uh, targeted killing of the bacteria of interest in your infection. But phages also produce enzymes, and an um, example of this would be lysins, which can slightly more indiscriminately kill bacteria. Uh, and uh, a lot of work is also going on this area about extracting lysins and using them in a, in a therapeutic way. Um, the other thing that phages can do is they have enzymes that can potentially disperse biofilms. And again, this might be something that we can harness and use in the future um, to break up, particularly for prosthetic joint infections, where we know biofilm is an important part of the pathology. But also, um, the, when we talk about the lysogenic phages, um, uh, potentially you could engineer phages or DAP phages so that they could insert DNA into antibiotic resistance genes and render the antibiotic uh, the uh, bacterium sensitive to the antibiotic in question. Uh, this area is probably less uh, characterized. And what are the advantages of phage therapy? Well, essentially phages are everywhere. They're in our environment, they're in our body. So we know they are safe, they are not toxic. Um, and what's good about phages is that they are independent of antibiotic resistance. So we may have very resistant, uh, multi-resistant bacteria, but actually um, may be susceptible to a number of phages when tested in a phage library. Um, when it's combined with antibiotics, in some situations, there's potentially synergy between the phage and the antibiotic more than you would expect from just the additive effect. So that's something, again, that is generates a lot of interest from a therapeutic potential. And there's also this concept called auto dosing, which essentially means unlike an antibiotic where we know you have a fixed amount of the drug, whether you've got one bacterium or millions of bacteria in an infection, and you just hope that you've got enough of the drug to kill the bacteria there, um, phage replication will only occur if there's bacteria. So if you have no bacteria, there won't be any replication of the phage. But if you have lots of bacteria, it will exponentially replicate and uh, target the bacterium in question. So it can scale up and scale down according to the number of bacterium in your infection. It also um, can evolve with the bacteria, so it can be adapted. And whilst we know phage resistance is potentially a problem, the phage is a living organism that can also develop counter mechanisms to counteract bacterial resistance. And it also has minimal impact on the host microbiome because it's so specific against uh, the, the, the strains that it can infect. But there are disadvantages to phage therapy. And one being that, um, humans and other hosts will, can have innate immunity to phages, but also over time, and particularly with intravenous uh, phage therapy, can go on to develop antibodies to phage to render them less active. Um, with Along with the synergy that we see, there's also some antimicrobials that there are potentially inhibitory effects, and particularly with some of the staphylococcal phages and rifampicin that has been observed. Um, and as I've mentioned before, you can develop phages uh, bacteria can develop resistant to phage um, and along a number of mechanisms which I've listed below. So how do people screen for phages in their in their biobanks? So this is uh, taken when uh, I attended a, a workshop in Belgium uh, and this is at the Queen Astrid Military Hospital when they do their screening. Uh, so this is three different strains of I think it was a E. coli and essentially these are different uh, phages being tested from top to bottom at serial dilutions and essentially what you're looking at is evidence of lysis in this double agar method where you've got a layer of agar a layer of your bacterium and the phage uh, uh, on top uh, and what you want is a phage that's uh, lytic at, at very low concentrations. 
But there are also now slightly more modern uh, methods of testing susceptibility and also potentially testing the effect of antibiotics. So um, in the top row here, this is a recent publication in CID that uh, there was a whole supplement on phage therapy that I would very much point you towards if you haven't come across it. But these are proposed uh, sensitivity methods where you do a kinetic assay using something called the Omnilog system. And essentially, you can see in real time after a few hours whether your bacterium is able to grow or not in the presence of the phage. And you can also add antibiotics to see whether there is a, a synergistic or antagonistic effect. So um, the, probably the most, uh, the, the most uh, extensive um, published cohort of cases of phage therapy so far uh, was recently published last year by the, the group in Belgium. And they published their first 100 cases of uh, compassionate use bacteriophage therapy for a number of different indications and the roots of which were um, applicable to that indication and uh, variable duration as well. So they had 100 cases, but 114 episodes of infection. And in the majority of them, they were combined with antibiotics. And this graph just shows you the, the types of indications they were using it for. So low respiratory tract infection was the most common, but it was followed by skin and soft tissue and bone and joint infection, which we know is an area that uh, people have been turning to for phage therapy. And these are the organisms that people targeted. Um, and in some cases, there were multiple organisms uh, with polymicrobial infection uh, and phages targeting um, at least two or three organisms. But on the whole, the majority of cases were uh, treating infections against Staph aureus and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And they said that in they reported uh, just under 80% clinical improvement, slightly lower than that when you're looking at eradication of your target bacteria, and only seven mild to moderate adverse reactions, which usually consisted of either fever or transient uh, LFT derangement. And um, when we look at phages in bone and joint infection, um, most of the data we have essentially comes from case reports and case series and a small cohort study. Um, there are two very good review articles that have um, come out over the last few years uh, that characterize uh, and summarize a lot of the data that we have so far of these compassionate use cases. The one thing just to remember is that there is a bit of crossover between these two groups because the uh, most recent article by Suetau was published, uh, published all the looked at all the cases since 2010. Um, but essentially what you can see is that the majority of cases, the phages are being administered topically. So this is either intra-articular or, or per OS, uh, and only a few cases where they're giving it in combination with IV and very few where it's either orally or IV alone. And again, the majority of cases are for prosthetic joint infection, but also uh, native osteomyelitis or septic arthritis. And, um, Again, they're targeting a lot of, of different organisms, but essentially Staphylococcus aureus, Staph epidermidus, and Pseudomonas seem to be the most commonly targeted organisms. And the adverse event rate is, is low in both groups. And essentially within the, the, the episodes reported, more often than not, it's been either local site reactions, fever, or transaminitis. But um, the duration of treatment varies really considerably. And this is an area I think we still have very little information to guide on, on how long people should be receiving therapy for. And this is an area that needs to be studied in more detail. And again, the dosage varies considerably. Um, so anywhere from 10 to the 7 to 10 to the 11 platforming units. So again, this is an, this is an area that we do need more data to, to guide us. But actually, if you look at the success rate, it ranges from just under 60 percent to sort of uh, 80, 88 percent. So um, for the cases that they've reported, actually, the, the outcomes were good. And where there came, were relapses, um, a proportion of those were due to different organisms. This is the only clinical study that's looked at um, phage therapy in prosthetic joint infection. Uh, and this came out of Russia and essentially um, used anti-staphylococcal phages in patients undergoing uh, one stage revision surgery. And it was compared with historical control. So obviously there are uh, potential for multiple biases there, but uh, they reported a very good response rate in the treatment group of over 95%. Uh, compared with 64% and very low rate of relapse in the treatment group who received phage. So what are the current issues with phage therapy? Well, there are lots. Um, 
part a part of the fact that that most of the um, use of bacteriophage therapy has has taken place in in uh, in Russia and Eastern European countries has has meant that there is a bit of hesitancy from regulatory agencies, particularly in in uh, Western Europe and um, and other uh, countries to. Uh, get, provide legislation or um, decide on on where they see phages fitting in as either a medicine or some other product, and also as a result, because of the lack of published data and clinical trials, there's has been a bit of hesitancy up until now from Western clinicians. The other thing about phage therapy is that human compassionate use has actually preceded the traditional animal model studies that usually that pro show proof of concept, safety, efficacy before going on to human use, which means it's difficult to go backwards from that now. The individualized nature of compassionate use means it's very difficult to develop a, 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 an effective randomized controlled trial when we're treating patients with very end stage um, difficult to treat infections. And if you want to produce a phage and market it, you need to not only show proof of safety and efficacy, but it also has to be manufactured under GMP conditions. And the problem with GMP conditions for phage manufacturers, it's incredibly costly and it takes a long time. So if you wanted to produce a phage against one strain of a Klebsiella, for example, it could cost you anywhere from £150,000 to £500,000. So for an indiv individualized treatment, that's not really uh, feasible. And the reasons for that is because of all the checks and um, requirements that are listed below to be able to meet GMP production standards. So I'm just going to take you on a whistle stop tour around the world and particularly reference the countries that are, are um, have the most experience of using phage therapy. So um, Georgia would be the, the country that tops the list. So they this is the Eliava Institute in Tbilisi. They have about 100 years worth of experience of phage therapy. And there you they have both the option of ready to use phages um, that requires a special authorization from um, from their government, but it, they're made to specified regulations, but they're not made to GMP, although that may change in the upcoming years as they're trying to align themselves more with the European, uh, with the EMA. Um, but you can also get uh, customised what is called magistral preparations for single patient use under special licences from the Georgian, Farm, uh, Georgian Health Ministry and authorised pharmacy. Um, so this is an example of an off-the-shelf phage cocktail that's used to target a number of organisms, including Staphylococcus, Streptococcus, Pseudomonas, and E. coli. Uh, and this is a list of the, the organisms that they, the, the Eliava Center are able to uh, provide phage therapy for. So if we move on to Russia, there's probably even less uh, available information, but what we do know is that there is a, a, a pharmacopoeia, which includes a monograph of phages on pro prophylactic and therapeutic use. And this is an example of an anti-staphylococcal phage that is produced by one of the Russian biotech companies. Um, but again, um, this is not to GMP standards. Uh, in Poland, uh, this is the Hertzfield Institute in Wroclaw, who uh, set up a phage therapy center in 2005, and they are able to administer phage therapy as an experimental treatment, and it's covered by the Declaration of Helsinki and a national act. So this is, again, all for compassionate use and all individualized therapy, and this is the, these are the organisms that they are able to provide phage therapy for. If we look at Belgium, um, probably in Western Europe, Belgium are currently leading uh, the way with phage therapy. This is the Queen Astrid Military Hospital in Brussels, which has a huge phage bank and um, currently produce uh, phages to what's called a magistral preparation. And this was helped by the fact that the Belgian authorities in 2018 uh, established regulations that meant that phages don't need to be considered as a medicinal product, but actually could be considered as an active product ingredient, which means it, it, there is a monograph that judges the quality, that specifies the quality of the phage and um, a, a approved lab will check all the phages that are produced by the Queen Astrid military to check it complies with that monograph to be able to certify it for use, but it's not to GMP, but to GMP like conditions. And so then the a pharmacist prepares this based on a prescription, and this is all under the direct responsibility of doctors and pharmacists. And in France, there's a similar situation to Belgium. They have a temporary use authorization. So this is all individualized uh, phage therapy requests 
which undergoes an expert committee evaluation. And again, it's all under compassionate use under the Declaration of Helsinki and all under the responsibility of the physicians and pharmacists. But there is a phage and neon program which was established where they are looking to develop and produce more therapeutic phages against uh, multi-resistant Staphylococcus aureus and Epidermidis and E. coli. And at the moment, there are two GMP certified Staph aureus products that are produced by a company called Faxium that are authorized for treatment on for bone infections in a compassionate use program. Uh, if we go to the US, so again, similarly, they have the FDA have an expanded access emergency uh, program where you can access what's termed as investigational new drugs. And in 2018, uh, there was the establishment of a phage center in San Diego, where they are leading uh, the way for compassionate use requests for phage therapy and also um, trying to push forward clinical trials in this area. And so again, this is all uh, phage therapy requests for life-threatening infections. And in Australia, similar to the US, they have an expanded special access scheme for experimental phage treatments. Uh, and if it's felt to be clinically justified and the patient gives written consent that they can administer phage therapy. And there is a stamp protocol that was published by Phage Australia, where essentially as part of an open label study, they have set out uh, how they're going to as assess safety and tolerability for all the patients who are receiving bacteriophage therapy for compassionate use in their program. So we can gather more data in this area. So I'm going to take you back to the UK, and I know this is an international um, uh, forum, but uh, uh, th this is the area that, that I've been working in and trying to kind of expand phage therapy in the UK. Um, and so what our current situation is, is that phages uh, can be imported from other countries and unlicensed special for named patients. And that has happened in UK uh, with phages received from Belgium and the US. Um, there recently was a case in Scotland where they have used uh, phage therapy for the first time in PGI. Um, but on the whole, most of the in infections treated so far have been diabetic foot infections. Um, but there is a slightly bizarre situation where if a phage is manufactured in the UK, it needs to be to GMP standards, whereas if it's imported and supplied from abroad, it does not need to meet GMP standards. And um, there are no current facilities in the UK that exist to be able to produce a, G a phage to GMP standards. So when we look at the clinical trials in the pipeline for prosthetic joint infection, th um, this time last year, I produced a slide and there were three trials that had been registered, but were not yet recruiting. But unfortunately, since then, two of those trials have actually been withdrawn. So there were two trials looking at uh, DARE plus a combination of different uh, phage treatments. Um, and that was in the US. So currently the only clinical trial in that is going on in PJI is coming is from France called the Fagodare study looking at Staph aureus phages for patients who are undergoing uh, DARE and it's a non-comparative double blind study, but it's essentially a pilot study. So Antonia, at last... Antonia, sorry to interrupt that we have one or two minutes, is that okay. right? Yeah. <laughs> So I will go past the the, the phage network meeting, um, but essentially we developed a network um, for clinicians in the UK and we've had meetings to try and, and move this along. And essentially this is all part of the phage UK network. Um, there was a report from the uh, Science Innovation Committee who did um, a several meetings to look at the potential phages and why uh, we were not uh, in line with other countries at the moment. And so they made a, a number of recommendations to try and uh, improve our access to phages. So at the moment, I think the, the future of what we try to achieve is that we need to try and, and push to have all three pipelines going in. So we need to allow um, to have access to off-the-shelf off fixed phage products, which would be ready-made GMP manufactured against a number of strains that you could use on a population scale. How long that would last for is, is probably still not clear. But also we need to continue the Suomazur individualized patient treatment and potentially change the, the, the government restrictions internationally that mean that these could be to non-GMP uh, production. And also in the future, we look at um, ways that you can adapt phages specifically against a different bacterial isolate and either combat antibacterial resistance or to be able to deliver uh, particular enzymes into that to break up biofilms or target bacteria in uh, specifically. And with AI and increasing um, technology, we hope that that would, that would be on the pipeline.
And so this is just my last slide to say what we think is needed to be able to, to, to push forward the agenda for phage therapy. So there's still a lot we don't know, and nobody is trying to claim that this is ever going to be a uh, substitute for antibiotics. At best, this is going to be an adjunct for uh, antibi antibiotic therapy. But in the absence of, of effective treatment and the fact we are entering on the post-antibiotic era, we do need to employ all these other, other tools that, that may be able to help. So I'm going to end at that stage. Great. Thanks, Antonia. Really, really a comprehensive presentation and very informative. One one question, uh, Antonia, we have time for one question, which is, um, are we uh, close to a clinical trial in bone and joint infection or PJI specifically? Uh, so there are potentially the the Fago Dare study. I think um, the company are, are are looking to roll out more uh, extensive phase two and three studies, but it's all you know in infancy at the moment. So I think that in, definitely in France, um, there there is a there are suggestions that there will be more studies in this area. Um, but at the moment, yeah, this is what we need to work with industry to try and try and help along. I think. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I think you need to go back to your OBIC conference. <laughs> uh, nice to see you, and thank you very much. And there is one question uh, which would lead us to the next presentation. The question is from Sajid Hassanian. Um, how can developing countries like Pakistan tackle orthospinal infection, especially with reference to antimicrobial resistant? Which gives me the pleasure to introduce uh, Julie Lorte from uh, Paris, France, to talk about AMR in fracture-related infection. What can we do? So I hope Julie's presentation would answer your, your question. Julie, it's all yours. The floor is yours. So I'm very happy to talk today um, about this subject, uh, which is fractures related infection and antimicrobial resistance. Um, first, a little introduction on this uh, subject um, to say that these kind of infections are quite specific. Uh, if uh, I would say FRI, I think it, it's uh, easier to, to say it like that. So FRI causes significant limit affection with um, certain complications like permanent function, function, function loss or even amputation. So it's really specific infections with incidence, uh, which uh, is uh, different between uh, closed a fracture and open fracture. So we have a really different uh, kind of uh, pathologies, uh, two different uh, epidemiology, we'll see, and also maybe different questions on antimicrobial resistance. The recurrence uh, level is quite uh, high, but it's uh, it can depend on the countries. We'll see that um, in the other slides. And it's actually quite a burden of disease with lots of complications and treatment costs. And for this patient, an increased length of stay and a decrease of quality of life. So this is uh, quite a um, uh, whole pathology to understand with the physiopathology, uh, also the microbiology field and the uh, antibiotic treatment. So we talk about that. Uh, what is complex in uh, FRIs actually? This is an old paper, but actually uh, it didn't change a lot in kind of complexity of this kind of infections. It's uh, um, about different sites of infection, especially in um, after operative fracture care. So you can see that all these different sites can uh, actually be difficult to manage all, all this kind of infection and difficult to have some um, consensual guidelines on the management of FRIs. Um, we have also to take in account the risk factors of uh, this of the patient. Uh, 
we who are involved in this kind of infection. So different sites, different patients, and also uh, you'll see difference between um, closed and open fracture. Uh, why is it different? When we talk about closed fracture infections, actually the cause of these closed fracture infections they are caused by normal skin flora. And so this kind of bacteria who can come from hospital, actually, from hospital acquired source. So um, to manage this kind of infection, actually, we can talk about usual primary preventive measure of uh, surgical site infection. So it's one kind of microbiology and one kind of management. In open fracture, we have an, another management because it's also a higher risk of FRI. So there is an energy mechanism because of the damage of the trauma. There is also the poor blood supply who could contribute to a greater risk of infection. And in addition to this normal skin flora, there is also, of course, the management of the orthopedic trauma surgical management. So you have different factors to take in account, and this is uh, a global management for this kind of infections. Um, we have to also think about the additional risk of contamination from external source. Uh, like uh, water, soils, uh, plus the hospital acquired infection. So it can be quite difficult to manage. So the degree and the type of contamination plays the whole role in surgical management and then also can have an impact. We'll see an antimicrobial resistance. So just a few words on diagnosis, because of course it's related to antimicrobial resistance. We have to do the diagnosis and the correct diagnosis to have the pathogens involved in this kind of infections. And then we can talk about um, adaptive treatment. So these are the guidelines and the recommended uh, factors, criteria to confirm the diagnosis of FRI. So like in prosthetic joint infections, we need about five tissue samples um, to make, um, to have an accurate diagnosis. And from different sites around the fracture, around the defect, um, to um, improve the, sensit the sensitivity of the diagnosis. Uh, different studies showed uh, that sonication technique could help to improve the susceptibility, the sensitivity of this diagnosis, to improve it by dislodging the biofilm bacteria of the implant surfaces. So, we can use the incubation uh, of this sonicate fluid also in blood cultures and in blood culture bottles, and it can improve the detection rate. And uh, of course, this uh, technique and this sonication technique can also help in uh, aseptic or presumably, presumably aseptic cases, but also to detect low variance pathogens. And this uh, kind of technique are also important because in 15 up to 20% of cases, we don't have any microbiological diagnosis. So that's important to improve the diagnosis so we can have the pathogen and then we can have the adapted treatment. Uh, another criteria quite important is the histology. Uh, in these guidelines, it's, um, it's important to remind that uh, microbiology should be associated to histology to improve diagnosis in these FRIs. So a word on, about uh, epidemiology we can uh, find in, in this kind of uh, infection. Actually, in this study, we can see that um, the different uh, type of infections 
were separated in early, delayed, and late infections according to the recommendation. So the early infections were less than two weeks, delayed between two and 10 weeks and late over 10 weeks. Um, and you can see that the main pathogens found in this infection were Staphylococci, uh, Staphylococcus aureus in uh, most of cases, but also coagulase negative Staphylococci with um, the main species Staphylococcus epidermidis. Uh, there are also streptococci and enterococci found in this kind of infections, but what is also important is the amount of gram-negative bacteria, and especially in delayed and late FRIs, the amount of gram-negative bacteria increases, which must be taken into account in uh, the um, antimicrobial susceptibilities and also for the treatment. Another study in uh, Australia, Australian hospitals. So it was um, a study conducted on, uh, uh, on 10 years, almost 10 years, with uh, surgical site infections. And uh, they also found that staphylococci were the main uh, species found in this uh, kind of infections, like one half uh, of the of infections were uh, caused by staphylococci. But there was also a quite high amount of pseudomonas species with almost 12% of uh, pseudomonas. Uh, in another study of worse and colleagues, uh, focusing on open fracture, uh, it was uh, almost polymicrobial infection. So that's what is important in open fractures compared to closed fractures. Actually, it's a contamination of environmental organisms. So um, a higher amount of gram-negative bacteria with Pseudomonas, Escherichia coli, uh, but also uh, group three of uh, Enterobacterial, which is also important regarding to antimicrobial resistance. In these open fractures, we have to keep in mind also the anaerobes, uh, and we can also have this, due to this environmental contamination, we can have also mycobacteria from soil or from the environment. So it's a quite large different spaces involved in open fracture infections. This uh, is important uh, to know and to, to keep in mind this epidemiology because uh, it also leads a discussion of antimicrobial prophylaxis. Uh, these guidelines, uh, especially in France, were updated very recently. Uh, in January 2024, a new recommendation uh, was, uh, was uh, made with an uh, expert to talk about open fracture and closed fractures infections. And, uh, and uh, the conclusion of uh, experts were to um, to look at the classification of these different kind of infections. And of course, uh, it was about the antimicrobial resistance. So the conclusion of this uh, antimicrobial prophylaxis uh, in Europe and also in France was to uh, choose uh, um, quite uh, um, low uh, actually spectrum antibiotics with cefazolin for uh, closed fractures and open fractures gustilo 1 and uh, with uh, another spectrum of uh, antibiotic for open fractures gustilo 2 and 3 um, where we can find uh, larger epidemiology and the environment uh, uh, contamination. So in this kind of cases, it's amoxicillin and clavulanic acid, uh, which uh, was chosen. And actually there was no change 
regarding to the last recommendation of 2018. So we can see that the level of uh, antimicrobial resistance for this choice of antibiotics didn't change. So what about antimicrobial resistance? We know that uh, generally it's increasing in the world and it remains now uh, one of the top 10 global public issues uh, identified by WHO. And uh, actually uh, now uh, up to one third of uh, classifiable organism causing FRIs I caused by MDR, multi-drug resistant bacteria. Uh, we know that this kind of MDR bacteria adversely affects the outcome of patients. We know that there is no place of broad spectrum, empirical broad spectrum therapy for weeks and weeks after surgery, but only used immediately after surgery and then adapted to microbiological diagnosis. It's important for the impact of antimicrobial resistance. So in some studies, uh, like uh, the study of Eisner in Germany, they measured about 400 pathogens in a level one trauma center, and they found one third of bacteria, multidrug resistant bacteria. Uh, they, if we look at the staphylococci isolates, actually about 80% were resistant to beta-lactam antibiotic agents, and only 44% of this organism were susceptible to cephalosporin. In another study conducted in UK on 160 page, 66 patients on chronic osteomyelitis, actually Staphylococcus aureus was the main uh, bacteria found, but also polymicrobial infection because of um, the, the epidemiology of these uh, FRIs. And um, many isolates were also resistant to uh, some antimicrobial regimens, uh, like fluxoxacillin, for example, um, was uh, one of the antibiotics uh, they focused on. And it was uh, really interesting of these uh, levels of antimicrobial resistance. If we talk about MRSA, uh, we can make a uh, focus on Staphylococcus aureus and um, on Staphylococcus aureus because it's one of the main spaces in this kind of infections. And we know that is the common pathogen in surgical site infections. Uh, actually, in uh, recent studies on the trends of uh, resistance uh, of Staphylococci and MRSA, um, it's quite uh, reassuring because in Europe and North America, the incidence of uh, this MRSA um, are stable or are um, even declining in the last 10 years. And also uh, in Canada, studies uh, in Canada show this uh, the same reduction uh, with, for example, also in France, some uh, levels around 15% of MRSA infection, which is quite stable. Uh, in a study of chron on chronic osteomyelitis and on the evolution of uh, resistance, uh, actually, we can see that uh, the MRSA uh, level was even uh, lower in uh, the 2013-2017 group comparing to 2001-2004 uh, group. So uh, on MRSA, these um, levels are quite uh, reassuring. The question uh, will be uh, almost on uh, gram-negative bacteria. So if we look at uh, this uh, study, this Belgian study conducted uh, during uh, four years and uh, with the usual classification of uh, FRIs, um, main uh, sites were tibia and femur uh, involved uh, in this and the case of the study, staphylococci almost present as we saw and polymicrobial infection, a gram-negative bacilli in um, open fractures, uh, 
Uh, we can see that regarding uh, antimicrobial resistance, actually no strain of uh, staphylococci were resistant to vancomycin. So uh, all strains were susceptible. Uh, regarding gram-negative bacteria, there was uh, uh, actually different results with uh, the best uh, levels of susceptibility were on cefepin or on meropenem. So cefepin was a uh, better antibiotic than uh, piperacillin tazobactam. Julie, two minutes, if that's all right. Okay, that's all right. Uh, another study in UK showed also um, an amount of uh, MRSA and VRE at 3.3% of infection and a little increasing of resistant gram-negative bacteria with ESBL or MC-resistant uh, uh, gram-negative bacteria. So the empirical systemic therapy uh, chose in this study was Tacoplanin associated to meropenem to cover all strains found in this infection. This study is very interesting because it's a European study with the SGI ESCMID group, especially on gram negative MDR or XDR, showed that uh, the prevalence uh, of ESBR was quite high in uh, anterobacterial with 72% of ESBL, a high amount of resistance on fluoroquinolones, also, you know, very. Uh, commonly used in bone and joint infections, and uh, carbapenem resistance at 17.5%. Uh, so what was uh, important in this study is that what the remission uh, of these cases were was only for the half of patients, and that uh, this kind of uh, multidrug resistance or X XDR uh, resistance were associated with low rates of remission after two uh, years of follow-up. In this study, the Chinese study, we can also see uh, this study compared PGIs and FRIs, and we can see that in FRI cohorts, there was there were more often found multidrug resistant organism compared to prosthetic joint infection. So also an impact of the, on the outcome of patient and of the uh, cure of queer, of course of a patient so so to 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 finish um, actually we can see that in this fris there are uh, like uh, two words uh, for example, in developing countries, we know that um, EMR are also very present in environment, food, water, and the misuse of antimicrobial can also drive to development of drug-resistant pathogens. So it's very important to make the accurate diagnosis, but it's also, of course, the resistant we can find in environments and in water, which can also promote infection. And uh, when we can see the studies, uh, for example, performed with a doctor without borders, we can see that the level, the, the amount of uh, antimicrobial resistance is really, really high. And the protocols we can find uh, in empirical therapy are, of course, very large to cover all these resistance strains. So regarding treatment, we can see that empiric treatment must cover uh, all the resistance we can find in local uh, ecology. And in this study, uh, we can uh, see that the better combination uh, found to cover all these strains, maybe meropenem associated to vancomycin, uh, also um, piperacillin tazobactam with glyco glycopeptides, uh, and uh, regarding to uh, cephalosporin like ceftriaxone or fluoroquinolones, we can uh, not uh, use, not so often use in empirical IV antimicrobial therapy. Of course, uh, as soon as we have the diagnosis, we can change and use other uh, molecules. So uh, to finish, uh, this kind of combination uh, in empirical therapy could associate uh, 
an agent against gram-negative bacteria associated to a lipo or glycopeptide to cover all these strains and especially the most resistant strains. Finally, I just add uh, one slide on the other factors we, because we uh, talked about bacteria, but there is also the biofilms. There are also other perspectives like uh, phage therapy, Antonia talked about just before, the virulence of uh, bacteria. And of course, a very, very important factor is a surgical surgery and surgical debridement because it is the uh, first point of the eradication of infection and of the prevention of a chronic infection, osteomyelitis. So in conclusion, I would say that FRIs are now increasing with the increasing number of surgeries around the world and also in developing country and with the management, with the, the improvement of the surgical management. So we have to keep in mind the different types of epidemiology uh, in closed fracture regarding open fracture and of course the antimicrobial resistant evolution, especially on gram negative bacteria and in open fractures with the polymicrobial uh, condition of these uh, infections. Regarding therapeutics, so surgery is uh, of course an important point, antibiotics and maybe new, uh, new targets and new innovative uh, treatment, new innovative treatment uh, could be associated actually to improve the management of this kind of uh, infection, very specific and uh, which could be very different regarding to the ecology of patients and uh, of treatment. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Julie. Julie, I tried to answer people's questions uh, as they come along on the chat. One uh, I will ask you, uh, you could answer verbally, and then if you kindly go into the chat and see whether you could answer them by typing the, the, the question I would like, what differentiates fracture-related infection from prosthetic joint infection in terms of cause diagnosis and treatment? In 30 seconds, please. What are, sorry, what are the difference? What differentiates fracture FRIs from PJIs um, in terms of diagnosis and treatment plan? For example, do you need five tissue samples to diagnose yeah. FRIs? Yeah, 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 actually. Um, I can just go... Um, uh, and, and, Go back, and, uh, maybe no. Yeah. On the okay, uh, I just um, uh, sum up. Yeah, the, the slide on uh, diagnosis. Yeah, in thirty seconds, actually. Yeah, we we should uh, also advise five tissue five tissue samples, but it depends on the on the sides uh, we have on surgery. So it between three and five. And we have almost the same in prosthetic joint infection, actually, it's three to five. So um, it's uh, almost the same. The, the really important part, I think, in this kind of infections are histology. Histology have to be associated with microbiological uh, diagnosis. It's very important. And another important point, we have also in prosthetic joint infections are uh, the very the standard culture uh, techniques, which could be which which should be now associated with molecular biology. It's very important, especially when you have antibiotics before uh, surgery and in open fractures. Of course, it can happen. So we should um, we should associate it the standard culture with. Uh, new techniques like uh, molecular biology and also uh, sonication. I talked about uh, sonication. Uh, sonication are, are very important. And we know that um, the, the use of uh, liquid uh, bros and uh, blood culture uh, bottles are also very important to be associated in prosthetic joint infections also, uh, they should be associated to solid media to improve uh, the, the sensitivity of diagnosis. That's great. There are a couple of questions left for you. If you kindly just go to the chat and then answer them, try um, by writing, typing the answer. Um, no Geo, problem. final talk and, and speaks about spinal infection. Gio Bertolucci is a 
clinical fellow in infection and immunology at the University Hospital Southampton, who is going to talk about his experience and his uh, uh, study in, uh, in uh, spinal infections. While Gio is loading his presentation, someone asked, can lesogenic phages be transformed to lytic phages? Um, I mean, the, the, air, the knowledge is expanding, but phages have their own temper, so they can change depending on temperature, pH, etc. Um, and then bacteriophage therapy for persistent bacteremia and stonotrophomonas multifilia with indwelling catheter or vascular conduit. If we can't remove it, uh, that's a challenge, but you need to find the phage, appropriate phage and GMP manufacturer. So again, a compassionate basis. So you need to have uh, the microbiology, uh, the infectious diseases and the scientists on board for that. So it's a different topic. Um, Gio, all yours. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, Cordo, for inviting me to share our research in such a prestigious setting. So um, this is a, a re retrospective analysis we conducted at the University of Southampton, and it, we are looking at spinal infections, and we're describing the epidemiology, diagnosis, and outcomes from our center. So just a, a bit of, as a bit of background to the, our research, we know that spinal infections are becoming a more and more common cause of admission, especially in the last decade in the UK. And as you can see here from this graph on the right, especially in from middle age down into our elderly patients, the numbers are rocketing up, probably due to sort of incidence of diabetes and other risk factors to increase prevalence of intravenous drug use. Despite this, we know that uh, it carries a really high mortality and morbidity burden for our population, but the evidence to guide sort of our strategies to manage this, these infections is very limited. And when we looked at the uh, guidelines available at the moment, they're all relying on low quality evidence. So our reason to pick this topic was to see how we are faring at Southampton, what level of service we're providing, and also gain insight into how these patients are doing in general, how they are diagnosed, and then how they do post-discharge. So the first thing we did was look at what guidelines are available at the moment to use as a benchmark. And the most recent one we found was the Infectious Disease Society of America, which IDSA, um, guideline published in 2015 uh, for the treatment and diagnosis of native vertebral osteomyelitis. And I don't want to read out all the recommendations here, but what I want to draw your attention to is the fact that all of them rely on low quality evidence, unfortunately. So with that in mind, we set off to systematically describe the presentation, diagnosis, the pathogens we encountered, and the treatment and outcomes for these patients at Southampton. And we selected, specifically selected, radiologically confirmed adult cases of spinal infections without prosthetic material. So very briefly, this is how we found our cases. We interrogated PACs. We started off with 89 cases and then uh, narrowed down to 53 after the exclusion criteria were applied. For each one of them, we went through the electronic inpatient record. We're very lucky at Southampton. We have access to quite extensive uh, patient records electronically, and then we follow them up, up for 100 days post-discharge. And for each patient, we collected demographic data, so uh, baseline characteristics, um, presentation data and admission data, so how they initially presented time for radiological diagnosis. And then we focus on the microbiology, so what we found in the blood cultures, and what uh, antibiotics we used. And then finally, we looked at how they fared after discharge. So to start off, just some baseline demographics for our cohort. So as in previous studies, we know that spinal infections are more common in men. And that's what we found in our study population as well, 64%. And we found quite a sort of spread of ages with a median age of 62 but really people, young people up to the, uh, down to the age of 18 being affected to our very elderly, so 80 plus. Uh, almost 20% of our cases were in over 80s, which is important to bear in mind in our hospital because these are patients that will be looked after by our geriatric colleagues. So not necessarily by the infectious disease team or by the spinal team. We wanted to focus on intravenous drug users because we know they make up a substantial proportion of spinal infection cases. And when we looked at how they distribute by age, stratified by age, unsurprisingly, they are overrepresented in under 60s. 
And actually, if you look at the numbers, they actually account for the majority, just over half of the cases of spinal infection in under 60s, and whilst they're vanishingly rare after the age of 60. Uh, moving on from the baseline demographics, we looked at the comorbidity burden for these patients. So just to quickly introduce the Charleston Comorbidity Index, this is a score that is based on things like age and chronic health conditions, and it used to predict a 10-year survival. And just to give you a flavor, a CCI of zero, so it's someone young with no comorbidities, gives you a 98% 10-year survival rate, whilst it, as you move up in the score, the survival rate goes down up to a CCI of six, which is sort of 2% 10-year survival, and then 0% from then onwards. So with that in mind, we looked at how comorbid our patients were, and they quite handily split into four portals, if you like. So one, the first 25% had no comorbidities, and they're sort of young, fit and well patients, at least on paper. And then there's a middle half, which are relatively frail, so they have a 10-year survival rate between 50 and 90%. And then the final quarter are the extremely frail patients who unfortunately you would not expect to be alive in 10 years time. Again, we wanted to look at how the intravenous drug user population sort of appeared in this distribution of comorbidities. And they make up, unsurprisingly, they make up the uh, younger end of the population and therefore end up being at least on paper, the more fitter uh, patients with spinal infections. Once we've collected all these data about the baseline mix, if you like, we compared uh, how the rates differed between people who survived the spinal infection and people who unfortunately passed away within 100 days of admission. And there are a couple of unsurprising findings so age uh, and the comorbidity burden were both associated with worse outcomes. And then diabetes was strikingly much, much higher rates in non-survivors of 43.8% where compared to 8% in survivors, uh, meaning that as probably as you would expect, diabetes was associated with worse outcomes in our population. So moving on to the how these patients presented at our hospital, we looked at clinical features of presentation, inflammatory markers, and the time to radiological diagnosis. And we'll come to why that is important in a minute. So when we looked at clinical features, we wanted to see if there was a universally agreed upon definition of a typical spinal infection. And unfortunately, uh, there's no sort of consensus as to what constitutes a typical presentation. Digging through the literature, we found that most uh, retrospective analysis uh, identifies back pain, fever, and neurological deficits as the most common symptoms. And when we went back to the IDSA guidelines, we found that they list a series of scenarios where the clinicians should consider diagnosis of spinal infections. And we use those IDSA guideline recommendations to build a sort of typical presentation of spinal infection picture. So the classic ones are back pain and neck pain with a new fever, elevated inflammatory markers or bacteremia, uh, or a fever with new neurological deficit without back pain. So with that in mind, we went back and looked at how our patients initially presented, and we found that three quarters presented with new or worsening back pain, and just under half presented with a, with a fever. The almost totality of our population had an elevated CRP, uh, uh, only a quarter presented with a neurological deficit. When we combined these presenting features and compare it to the IDSA guidelines, we found that three quarters of our patients presented in a way that the IDSA guidelines would identify as typical for a spinal infection. Um, whilst the remaining quarter presented in more sort of atypical ways, mainly with uh, reduced uh, conscious level or confusion or pyrexia of unknown origin. Um, in terms of the inflammatory markers, so our presentation, uh, strikingly half of our patients had a normal white cell count and admission and uh, a, a few had leukopenia with 43% um, roughly having presented with leukocytosis. And it's a different story for CRP. So the vast majority of them had an elevated CRP on admission with a, a good range with a median of 160 milligrams per liter. Uh, but just to emphasize that one in 20 of these patients that will turn out to be to have a spinal infection presented with a normal white cell count and CRP on admission.
Um, finally, in terms of the presentation, we looked at the time to radiological diagnosis, uh, which was almost universally based on an MRI scan. Uh, we had one patient that was solely based on CT, who unfortunately self-discharged before he could have an MRI done. And we found that three quarters had a diagnosis made within one week, which I thought was quite impressive, and approximately half had the radi radiological diagnosis within three days. However, when you stratify patients in terms of how they presented, you start to see quite quickly a difference. So in this graph, you have a blue line, which is represents the cum cumulative diagnosis, radiological diagnosis for patients who presented typically. So that will be your back pain and fever, um, as opposed to the red line, which are the patients who present the atypically. So the confusion and the reduced GCS. And as you can see, there's quite a, a marked separation of the two. And the median time to diagnosis was six days for the people presenting atypically and only two days for the more typical presentations. And when we looked at whether the time to radiological diagnosis was different between people who survived the admission and people who didn't, uh, the median time was nine days for people who did not survive. So uh, non-survivors had a time to radiological diagnosis of nine days as a median, whilst the people who did survive uh, only two days, and there was a statistically significant difference. So moving on to our investigations. Uh, so we looked at blood cultures and what we grew from them. And then uh, quickly we looked at uh, spinal tissue cultures and the PCR. So reassuringly, almost the totality of our patients had blood cultures done at some point during the admission and 80% had a set sent within 24 hours, which I thought was quite reassuring in terms of uh, performing the blood cultures. And from these blood cultures, we identified a responsible pathogen in 62% of cases. So 33 out of our 53 patients had a positive blood culture. Um, unfortunately, 30, 34% had negative blood cultures and 3% did not have any blood cultures done during admission. But it was not just based on blood culture. So in some patients who perhaps went to theater, um, that we had deep tissue samples sent for culture and some for PCR. Now, it's, I think it's important to emphasize that this are sort of, these are very small numbers. We only had five patients that went on to have deep tissue samples sent. And of these, three were negative and two had positive results matching the blood cultures. And similarly, very small numbers for PCR, one which matched the blood culture and the tissue culture results and what which was negative. So in summary, in our cohort, and again, it's very small numbers, deep tissue samples and for culture and PCR did not add any significant sort of new information. In terms of what we grew in our cohort, um, so unsurprisingly, uh, Staphylococcus aureus tops the, the chart with 43% of cases followed by uh, gram negative, so enterobacterialis. Uh, we had four cases of E. coli and one pseudomonas, and then followed by one, only one case of MRSA, uh, one gram negative anaerobes, and a, a variety of other gram positive microorganisms. And as I was saying before, roughly a third of our patients did not have a micro microbiological diagnosis. However, so uh, Staph aureus remains the key culprit in this situation. However, if you look at the um, different pathogens in different age groups, we found that patients of aged over 80 had a much higher rate of gram-negative bacteria isolated compared to the general population. So 22% uh, as opposed to 9.1% in under 80s, uh, which was statistically significant and is probably something worth bearing in mind when we are uh, talking about what antibiotics to give. So that links quite nicely with the next section of the presentation, which is what antibiotics we used uh, in our cohort. So the IDSA guidelines suggest six weeks of parenteral antibiotics or highly bioavailable oral therapy for most patients. And we followed guidelines quite closely. So our median time on antibiotics was, was 50 days, uh, which is just over sort of seven weeks. Uh, and the median was 44 to 80 days. When you, we looked at why the uh, median time of antibiotics was slightly longer, uh, we found that for simple cases of spinal infection, so in the absence of uh, epidural or spinal abscesses, the uh, median time of an antibiotics was six weeks. 
in line with the recommendations for people with more complex infections. So these are your people with uh, your patients with spinal, spinal abscesses, uh, iliosaurus abscesses. Um, the uh, antibiotic therapy was expanded, uh, pushing our median time on antibiotics a bit up. Gio, two minutes. Lovely. Um, so just to mention what antibiotics uh, we used, beta-lactams were by far the most common antibiotics used empirically. So this is where the diagnosis might not even be, so it's not certain and might not even be suspected, as you can see from natrofurantoin and toin in our table. But 90% of our patients basically started on a beta-lactam. Um, and then when we looked at which beta-lactams were used, uh, anything from the sort of very narrow spectrum, benzyl penicillin, fluoxacillin, up to meropenem, so quite a variety of agents. And then uh, most of our patients, so just over half actually, went home on to complete a course of antibiotics uh, as an out, on an outpatient based, uh, and cotrimoxazole was the agent of choice in that setting, uh, and very few remained on IV antibiotics as outpatients on keft keftraxin. Uh, just to briefly mention side effects, so we define them as any untoward symptoms or uh, laboratory finding that would prompt us to change antibiotics, and we found that 15%, so roughly one in six, needed a change in antibiotic therapy because of side effects. And the most common uh, side effect was neutropenia, and the most common culprit was keftraxin, which, again, unsurprising given that it was quite widely used in our cohort. Um, just to briefly mention that the numerical number of reported side effects goes up with the longer the antibiotic uh, therapy. So you can see uh, up to sort of eight weeks, uh, very minimal reported side effects, and then it skyrockets between 57 and 84 days. And similarly, if you look at distribution by age, our younger patients tended to report fewer side effects compared to older patients. And just to finally conclude, uh, we looked at outcomes for our patients. So we looked at outcomes from admission up to 100 days post-discharge. And unfortunately, two of our patients died in hospital from overwhelming infection um, and two self-discharge and 49 discharge. So inpatient mortality was relatively low at 3.7%. But the story changes when you look at the follow-up period so in the 100 days. So in that time period between discharge and 100 days, uh, 14 patients died, two were sort of expected deaths or discharge on palliative pathways from hospital, and we think died from as a direct consequence of infection, whilst the other uh, six of them died of unrelated causes, and unfortunately for the last six, we don't have any cause of death available. Um, so that gives us an overall mortality at 100 days post admission of 16 out of 53, which is uh, 30 30. 0.1%, so quite a high mortality rate. Um, so just to wrap things up and conclude, just a few uh, key take-home message. So we reviewed 53 patients admitted to a spinal center with radiologically confirmed spinal infections. We found that it affects a wide variety of quite heterogeneous population ranging in both in age and comorbidities. And surprisingly, diabetes, age, and a higher comorbidity index were associated with worse outcomes. And uh, we found that it remains quite a subtle and sometimes insidious diagnosis to make with up to sort of almost a quarter of our patients presenting atypically and one in 20 having normal inflammatory markers. And we know that a an atypical presentation is associated with delay in radiological diagnosis and, and then uh, worse outcomes for them. Uh, in terms of what we found in microbiology wise, Staphorus remains the most common pathogen but in patients over 80s, which we, we know we are expecting to see more of going forwards, gram negatives become more important. And that's something worth thinking about when selecting uh, antimicrobial therapy for our patients. And although the numbers are very, very small in our cohort, uh, deep tissue culture and PCR provided no added value uh, in this series. Uh, I think I can skip over this slide in the interest of time. And the last final message, I think, is that mortality in this group of patients is 30% reflecting both how comorbid and frail some of our patients are and how severe the infection is. Thank you so much for your attention and thank you, Corda, again for letting me present this research to this platform. I'm happy to take any questions.
Gio, thank you very much uh, for this interesting um, study. Small numbers, but still interesting. Um, Gio, one question. Given that um, your tissue diagnosis, the majority of patients had blood cultures taken, and especially if it's taken within the first 24 hours, you get a positive microbiology. Uh, would you push surgeons for deep samples, deep tissue samples or not? Uh, so this is quite interesting. I presented this data to surgeons recently, um, and they were sort of, that. this is in keeping with what they see in day-to-day -day practice. So although the numbers are small in our cohort, this is sort of supported by anecdotal evidence from our surgical colleagues. And I think in the context of a patient who is getting better on empirical antibiotics, subjecting them to an invasive procedure with risks associated with um, uh, sort of a, a deep tissue biopsy, um, which may have very, very low yield, I think it will be possibly a questionable decision. I think it's different if you're struggling and you're not getting on top of things with antibiotics alone, but the vast majority of patients get better with antibiotics, and I think it's difficult to justify an invasive procedure. I think that's a really important message. The key thing, patients are getting better. Um, and um, if they're getting better, especially, I know I'm talking about the, at least in the NHS setting, in the UK setting, when there's um, a huge backlog since COVID uh, lockdowns and COVID pandemic. So there's a, a huge pressure on theatre time. So if you could help our surgeons not to do unnecessary interventions, I think that would be a, a great without affecting outcomes. So the key thing is getting better. A, st a question from Bayaz Ali Shah, a study revealed spinal infection are worse than limb infection with worse outcome. How to avoid them? Any bedside tips, um, <laughs> uh, usual precautions? Uh, Julie, feel free to intervene. Uh, and these are really complex infection. And as you could um, hear from Geo, 20, over 20% atypical presentation, especially in the elderly. So I think it's really difficult. And um, any tips on how to avoid them? I think I think they're challenging. They're challenging. and uh, very, very challenging. I think especially yeah. with an aging population and increasing rate of diabetes. So the risk factors are going up. And uh, I think it will be it will become diabetes. even more of a challenge going yeah, forward. Yeah, I was going to say diabetes control. Maybe it's one thing you could intervene here. Aside from bacterial infection, have you noticed any persistent fungal pathogens? Um, no, and it was quite it's quite surprising. We were expecting to see some cases of uh, TB, for example, uh, but over a period of two years, we did not find uh, any any other pathogens. So it was purely bacterial and thirty percent undiagnosed. I mean, fungal infection has been reported, including aspergillus in a native uh, non-immunocompromised uh, individuals. Spinal osteomyelitis, discitis, or aspergillus infections are present, can can happen, um, and candida, of course. Um, and so you need to, once you have those specialist candida, you need to exclude uh, seeding infections, especially from deeper sores or endocarditis, for example. I think we have covered all the questions. Uh, let me see the other chat. Yeah, just a reminder to register for the next free webinar on the 11th of April, please, at uh, the same time. And also ISAC is organizing the ICC, International Congress of Antimicrobial Chemotherapy, which this year will be in Istanbul in November. Please have a look at the ISAC's website for registration purposes and the full program, which is really comprehensive and interesting program. And I think I have nothing else uh, to say apart from thank you to ISAC's committee, especially uh, Fee Johnston for her organization and for our three spe speakers, uh, Antonia and Julie and Gio, uh, for their time and also the interesting talks. And thank you for your participation with the questions. Um, and um, great. Enjoy the rest of the day and see you another time. Take care.